Hi, everyone. So I'm back home from the book sale and we had an amazing time, got a lot of books, probably way more than I needed, um, but uh, we enjoyed it. So it's going to be a little bit of a long video today because I have a lot of things to show you and tell you. Um, so we went to the book sale. It was very crowded, so I didn't bother trying to video there. Um, and then there was a farmer's market next door. So we went there, bought a couple of treats. Um, and it's a beautiful day here. So if you hear some noise in the background, it's, um, it's because I have the windows open, which is, uh, you know, practically the first time since winter. So it's nice to have a little fresh air coming in. So I'll show you some of what I bought. So, uh, there was, um, it was all in, uh, genres. So it was like mystery and fiction and biographical. And so I kind of searched through the whole thing and just um, kind of randomly picked ones I thought looked interesting. So the first one I got was Finding Gobi. Uh, so on the back, it says it's a miraculous tale of Dion Leonard, a seasoned ultra marathon runner who crossed path with a stray dog while competing in a 155 mile race through China's Gobi Desert. The lovable pup, later named Gobi, proved what she lacked in size she more than made up for in heart. Gobi ran with Dion across massive sand dunes and through the Tian Shan Mountains, yurt villages, and black sands of the Gobi Desert, keeping pace with him for nearly 80 miles. And so it talks all about that and his adventure with that cute little dog. So that one should be really good. Uh, this one I got because... Um, uh, being Canadian, that's, you know, I like to to showcase, you know, Canadian works as well. And this one is um, a more, um, I guess, probably it would be for maybe, um, maybe teenagers or um, adults, either one. But it's uh, Laura Secord, The Heroic Adventures of a Canadian Legend. So I'll be quite, uh, I'll be quite honest. The only thing I know about Laura Secord is there's Laura Secord stores um, where they make delicious chocolates and, and treats. Um, I don't know anything about her adventures, so I'm interested to read that. Um, on the back, it says, uh, during the War of 1812, Canadian and British forces battled against the United States with great determination. Many of these soldiers displayed incredible bravery in the face of the enemy. The most legendary act, however, was performed by a civilian woman. This is a story of Laura Secord, a devoted wife and mother who risked life and limb to warn the British military of an impending American attack. Sorry to all my American friends and, and watchers. <laughs> I mean, it was a long time ago, so, but hopefully the story is good. And uh, the next one I got was uh, Lisa Scottaline. I've read a couple of hers before, although I'll be honest, I can't remember their names, but this one's called Every 15 Minutes. And it says, uh, Dr. Eric Parrish, a brilliant and caring psychiatrist, has been unknowingly targeted by a sociopath. His hands are already full, having recently separated from his wife and trying his best to be a single dad to his seven-year-old daughter. And now Eric faces a new challenge in the form of a troubled teenage boy who harbors an obsessive crush on a girl. Because of secrets that this boy divulges in therapy, Eric grows concerned for the girl's safety and becomes embroiled in a dangerous dilemma. Should he report his potentially dangerous patient to the authorities? Just as Eric reaches his decision, the unimaginable happens and the game is on. The clock begins ticking and Eric finds himself plunged into a living nightmare and at the hands of a sociopath bent on destroying his practice, his family, and his life. And I'm hoping that won't be too scary, but we'll see. <laughs> See how it goes. And the next one I got was called Lightning Lingers. And it says, uh, Catherine Barrett, a dedicated young doctor, receives a terrified phone call from her brother. TJ, he's running away to Mexico to save himself and their family from an unnamed killer. He warns her not to come after him and not to go to the police, as there is no one she can trust. But Catherine realizes there might be someone she can trust. She turns to her former high school sweetheart, Jake Monroe, the man whose heart she broke a decade earlier. Catherine asks Jake to fly her into a remote and dangerous part of Mexico where no one else dares to go. Jake had always thought that one day Catherine would realize she needed him, but he didn't expect it to go down this way. Still, he can't resist the beautiful blonde he has never been able to forget. They set off on an adventure that will take them into the past, unravel a decade of secrets, 
and lead them into the heart of a lightning storm that will change the way they look at their families, the world, and each other. That one sounds really good. And I've never heard of uh, Barbara Freethy. So this will be interesting. All right, and the next one was Barbara Novak, One Perfect Summer. And it says, when Serenity Alston swabbed her cheek for 23 and Me, she joked about uncovering some dark ancestral scandal. The last thing she expected was to discover two half-sisters she didn't know existed. Suddenly, everything about her loving family is drawn into question, and meeting these newfound sisters might be the only way to get answers. The women decide to dig into the mystery together at Serenity's family cabin in Lake Tahoe, with Reagan navigating romantic politics at work and Lorelai staring down the collapse of her marriage. All three women are converging at a crossroads in their lives. Before the summer is over, they'll have to confront the past and determine how to move forward when everything they previously thought to be true was a lie. But any future is easier to face with family by your side. And that just looks like a great summer read. So I'll, uh, tuck that one aside until later on this summer. So that'll be great. And this one, um, they had it in with, I think it was in with the cookbooks or something, but I don't think it is a cookbook. It's called 52 Loaves, A Half-Baked Adventure. So looks interesting. Uh, Try to see if it's got something that tells you what it's about here. Oh, not really. Uh, What does it say on the back? Well, it doesn't tell you much. Um, The author of the best-selling $64 tomato embarks on a gastronomic uh, odyssey spanning three continents, a backyard wheat field, two exploding ovens, one herniated vertebrae, a crisis of faith, and a 1,300-year-old monastery in his quest to produce a perfect loaf of bread. So it sounds funny. We'll see what it's like. And let's see. I have a whole other stack here. All right. And this one I um, was really glad to see because it's coming up in our book club in a few months. It's called The Secret Messenger. And it says uh, it goes between Venice 1943 and London 2017. So it says Venice 1943. The world is at war and Stella Giuliana is leading a double life. By day, she works in the lion's den as a typist for the Reich. By night, she risks her life as a messenger for the Italian resistance. Against all odds, Stella must impart Nazi secrets, smuggle essential supplies, and produce an underground newspaper on her beloved typewriter. But when German commander General Rugel becomes suspicious, it seems he will stop at nothing to find the mole, and Stella knows her future could be in jeopardy. London, 2017. Years later, Louisa Belmont finds a mysterious old typewriter in her attic. Determined to find out who it belonged to, Louisa delves into the past and uncovers a story of fierce love, unimaginable sacrifice, and ultimately the worst kind of betrayal. So I do love those historical uh, fiction books, um, especially concerning World War II, which a lot of them seem to be. Enough that I actually, as I was reading that, I thought, did I already read this? (laughs) So I'm not positive. Maybe I just read something similar. I guess we'll find out when I start reading it again, if I've read it before. So the next one, um, I think this one is uh, maybe a war story one as well. Um, It's called Meet Me Under the Clock by Annie Murray. And it's a, a big, thick one. It says, growing up in Birmingham, Sisters Sylvia and Audrey Whitehouse were always like chalk and cheese. I love that expression. When the Second World War breaks out, Sylvia is still dreaming of her forthcoming marriage to fiancé Ian, while Audrey jumps at the career opportunities offered by the WAAF. Audrey joins the ranks of RAF Cardington, but finds that her new freedom also brings temptation. When she goes too far one night, the consequences ripple through the Whitehouse family. Meanwhile, Sylvia is doing her bit as a railway porter, much to Ian's dismay. He thinks the job isn't very feminine. Unlike Sylvia's new friend, Kitty, who is as sweet and pretty as can be, but Kitty's innocent nature hides a dark secret. As the pressure of rationing, bombing raids, and sleepless nights grow, the two sisters must decide what they really want from life and whether they're brave enough to fight for it. So that one sounds really good, too. Although I'm a little... um, 
overwhelmed by how thick it is, but we'll see. I'm sure it'll go quickly. And I don't think I've ever read one of these, or if I have, I've forgotten, but they seem to be everywhere and pretty popular. Uh, it's one of the Ladies Detective Agency. And this one is In the Company of Cheerful Ladies. So, oh, look, and it has a picture of the author on the back, which I always like. It's, you know, kind of personal to be able to see what they look like. So it says, in the latest widely praised addition to the beloved number one ladies detective agency series, the charming and ever resourceful Precious Ramots Ramotswa finds herself faced with new challenges and intriguing surprises. Precious is busier than usual at the detective agency when she discovers an intruder in her house on Zebra Drive, and perhaps even more baffling, a pumpkin on her porch. That's a little strange. Uh, her associate, um, Madame Mizuki, also has a full plate. She's taken up dance lessons, only to be partnered with a man with two left feet. And at uh, Tlaquin Road Speedy Motors, one of Mr. J.L.B. Maconi's apprentices has run off with a wealthy older woman. But what finally rattles her normally unshakable composure is a visitor who forces her to confront a difficult secret from her past. All right. So that sounds interesting. Could be a good read. I hear they're pretty easy to go through. So that's good too. Uh, so I seem to have a wartime theme here. Uh, not purposely. It just happens to be the ones I gravitate to, I guess. This one is called Wartime at Woolworths. So I don't know if Woolworths um, is something that you have in America um, I know we used to have them in Canada, um, although that was a long time ago. So there's, I don't think any around anymore that I know of, but it was just a, a department store like Macy's or JCPenney or something. So this one says the Woolworth girls face their biggest challenge let yet. Oh, maybe it's the, um, I think it's maybe their last name. Maybe they don't work for Woolworths. It's just their name. Anyway, it says Frida leaves the safety of her hometown to go in search of her distant mother. But when she arrives, it's the scars of war that greet her. Will she ever be able to find her mother? Ruby is a kindly soul looking out for everyone, none more so than the cantankerous Vera. But when Vera's home is under threat, Ruby realizes something must be wrong. What is it she's hiding? And Maisie is devoted to her work and her young family, but her happy life leads her to think of the home she left behind. What will she find when she goes looking for the past? With families separated by war, will the Woolworths girls be able to pull together? Okay, probably more interesting that their last name is Woolworths and not that they work at Woolworths. But maybe it's both. I don't know. We'll find out. All right. So the next one is actually three stories in one. Um, it's uh, Remember Me, Firefly Lane, and The Birds and the Bees. So two of the authors I've read before, uh, Sophie Kinsella and Kristen Hanna, and the other one is Millie Johnson. So it should be pretty good with the um, three books together. So I'll read you what it says um, on the inside of the cover. It says, remember me, if you had a chance to transform your life, change your frizzy hair into a smooth chignon, uh, fix your crooked teeth, take a high flying job and marry a handsome man who just happened to be a millionaire. Wouldn't you grab it all with both hands? The question is, would you really be happier? Lexi Smart is about to find out. And that's the one by Sophie Kinsella. Uh, Firefly Lane by Kristen Hanna. And that's actually one of hers I haven't read. It says an emotionally powerful novel about love and loss and the magic of friendship, which follows the lives of Tully Hart and Kate Malarkey across three decades. As the fashions and the songs change, so does the nature of their friendship, but it remains a precious touchstone in the two women's lives. And then the last one is The Birds and the Bees by Millie Johnson. And it says, writer and single mom Stevie is just weeks away from her dream wedding. When her fiance Matthew runs off with his sexy colleague Joe to the fury of Joe's man, Adam. Despite their total dislike of one another, Stevie and Adam plot to win back their lovers with shocking and hilarious consequences. I don't know why they'd want to win them back considering, but we'll see. So at least two of these, I think I'll like the other one. We'll see how it goes. All right. So two left from the, uh, the book haul. So this one is a memoir. It's called birding with Yates. So not sure what that'll be like. 
Um, on the back, no, inside the cover, it'll tell a little bit about it. It says, in fall 2007, Lynn Thompson experienced a huge life shift. Her teenage son, Yates, is just beginning high school. Yates has always struggled against the system, against the pressure to conform. He is a poet at heart, acutely sensitive, highly intelligent, and solitary by nature. Mother and son have always been close, but after 14 years as a stay-at-home mom, Lynn is going back to work for her husband, Ben, who has just opened his own bookstore. When Yates and Lynn take a trip to Vancouver Island, they discover a mutual love of bird watching. Lynn is the only other person Yates has found who loves nature and watching birds. Plus, she has a car. Lynn describes in wondrous detail the many trips she and her son take from the Y Marsh and Palais Island in Ontario to Vancouver Island in British Columbia to an ill-fated trip to the Galapagos Islands. The two grow closer with each birdwatching expedition. At the same time, Lynn notices that her son is beginning to pull away and she must learn to let go. So anyway, sounds good. It's, um, uh, I, I think the, it could be interesting. I mean, we'll see um, if, if it's, you know, if they tell us some things about the birds that they're seeing and, um, and then include some of the stuff with the mother son relationship could be good. And the last one that I got was called the forgotten seamstress. So I really like the cover. I love the, the purple on there. And it says she kept her secret for a lifetime. Uh, a shy girl with no family, Maria knows that she's lucky to have landed in the sewing room of the royal household. Before World War I casts its shadow, she catches the eye of the Prince of Wales, a glamorous and intense gentleman. But her life takes a far darker turn, and soon all she, is left, all she has left is a fantastical story about her time at Buckingham Palace. Decades later, Carolyn Meadows discovers a beautiful quilt in her mother's attic. When she can't figure out the meaning of the message embroidered into its lining, she embarks on a quest to reveal its mystery, a puzzle that only seems to grow more important to her own heart. As Carolyn pieces together the secret history of the quilt, she comes closer and closer to the truth about Maria. Hmm, that sounds intriguing. So those are the 13 books I got at the book sale this morning. Um, it surprisingly didn't spend a lot and uh, any of the money raised was for women in music, which is nice. And then I come home and realize I didn't get the mail on Friday. And sure enough, there's a box of books from Book Outlet. So I got three more books. So these ones, and I, I realized I need a bigger bookshelf. So, so I think that's what I'll be shopping for next is a, a bookshelf. And I don't have, I'd like to put it right behind me. And it, there's not because I've got that, um, the circular um, decor there. Uh, I need something that's kind of short, but long. So I'm going to go searching for that maybe at Ikea or someplace over the next few days and see what I can find. Cause now I need a place to put all these books. Um, I was doing mostly Kindle books and then doing these booktube videos. It's, it's so much more fun to, to show you the actual books. So that's, I've kind of went a little crazy. So here are the three books that I got from the book outlet. Uh, the first one is the Bloomsbury girls. And it says uh, Bloomsbury books is a quiet, dusty tradition bound London books bookstore that has persisted and resisted change for a hundred years run by men and guided by the general manager's unbreakable 51 rules. It's a lot of rules. But in 1950, it's a new world. And at Bloomsbury Book, the girls in the shop have plans. Evie Stone, Vivian Lowry, and Grace Perkins are determined to build new lives for themselves and for their beloved store in a world filled with dazzling characters from Daphne du Maurier to Peggy Guggenheim to Samuel Beckett. The only way forward for the women at Bloomsbury Books is to contend with the domineering male staff, band together, and take over the bookshop. So there you go. Sounds like they're going to have a coup. <laughs> and the next one I got was The Reading List. And it says, uh, Widower Makish lives a quiet life in West London. Everything seems to be about London. Um, where he shops every Wednesday, goes to Temple, and worries about his granddaughter, Priya, who hides in her room all day reading. 
Alicia is a bright but anxious teenager working at the local library when she discovers a forgotten slip of paper in the back of To Kill a Mockingbird. It contains a list of novels she's never heard of before. Intrigued, she decides to read every book on the list. As each story gives up its magic, the books transport Alicia away from the painful reality she's facing at home. When Makesh arrives at the library, desperate to forge a connection with his bookworm granddaughter, Alicia wonders if the books might be a lifeline for him too. As the reading list begins to circulate in their community, new readers discover how fiction can illuminate so much about joy and sorrow in real life. And the lady on the that wrote the book, Sarah Nisha Adams, that's got her picture on the back. So that one sounds really good. I'm excited to, to get started on that one. I love books about books. And then the last one, um, it was just kind of a uh, impulse purchase, I guess, because uh, I've never heard of this one before, but it was when I saw it and kind of read a little bit on the back, I thought, oh, that sounds good. So this one's called Iona Iverson's Rules for Commuting. And it says, um, every day, Iona Iverson, a stylish, opinionated, larger than life magazine advice columnist, rides a train to work with her dog, Lulu. Every day, she seems the same people, whom she knows only by nicknames, impossibly pretty bookworm, and Mr. Too Good to be True. Of course, they never speak. Seasoned commuters never do. Then one morning, the man she calls smart but sexist manspreader chokes on a grape right in front of her. He'd have died were it not for the timely intervention of Sanjay, a nurse who gives him the Heimlich maneuver. This single event starts a chain reaction and an electric group of people discover that a chance encounter can blossom into much more. It turns out that talking to strangers can teach you quite a bit about the world around you and even more about yourself. And I guess I kind of like the idea of it because um, when I first started to take a bus, um, I was kind of told by people like, you know, you don't talk to people on the bus, <laughs> you know, it's just not done. And, uh, and I'm the type of person that tends to talk to strangers. Um, I mean, not, you know, full on conversations, but it's like, oh, I like your hair. Oh, this, you know, whatever. And so it was, it took a while for me to get used to just sitting there and not speaking to anybody. And, uh, and I still think it's a little weird kind of like getting into an elevator with people and nobody says anything. You all just stare at the wall. So, <laughs> so I kind of like the idea of talking to strangers. All right. So there we go. Um, all together, I have uh, 16 new books to read and we will add them to the list and we will get to them all eventually. All right. I hope you have a great day and I hope wherever you are, I hope it's nice and sunny like it is here today and you get to enjoy some of it. All right. Talk to you soon. Bye-bye.